I also want to mention that make the best use of the opportunity here. We are an interdisciplinary university, so that means that don't shy away from entering into other courses and programs across all schools. We have 12 different schools in law, business, international affairs, public policy, liberal arts, journalism, architecture, banking and finance, environmental sustainability, psychology and counseling, environment and uh, uh, sustainability, psychology and counseling, and of course, public health and human development. And you should know that as undergraduate students, you can take courses across all schools. So you are studying English uh, literature here, but if you want to take a course in the BA Economics in the Public Policy School, feel free to do it. If you want to take a course on Accounting in the Business School, feel free to do it. Uh, if you want to take a course uh, on International Affairs or in Law, feel free to do it. Every day after 4 p.m., nearly 500 interdisciplinary electives are offered and made available to all students and that's all part of what you have uh, become enrolled. So please make the best use of it. Don't confine your imagination to one school and one program. The idea of a, a true interdisciplinary humanities and liberal arts, social sciences university is to enable you to take courses across different schools and we've created that ecosystem here. Lastly, I want to say that um, the opportunities that this university provides I hope will be transformative. Just to give you a perspective, uh, the thousand plus faculty members that I talked about, are com uh, they come from 46 countries in the world. I mean, think about it. Uh, the the 10,000 students I talked about, they come from over 40 countries and across all states of India and Union Territory. So it's a very diverse, uh, you know, uh, community. And just uh, engage with them and get out of your comfort zone. Uh, challenge yourself, you will be exposed to new ideas. Uh, don't confine your learning experiences within the classroom. Uh, attend conferences, seminars, lectures and workshops. Uh, an over dosage of that will be held here. There are, imagine, there are 12 commencement lectures. So attend other commencement lectures too. Uh, so the idea is to be part of a vibrant intellectual ecosystem that this institution provides. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, uh, it's 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 important for you to think in terms of the future don't be hesitant to walk into the office of the career services and ask them what they can do to help you uh, secure internships what kind of opportunities that are out there for you to spend your summers and winters uh, engage yourself but above all uh, you know immerse yourself into reading and reflecting and thinking and writing and in that process uh, uh, you know simply making the best use of this opportunity because frankly uh, it is a privileged opportunity. I mean also think for a moment that what has been made possible here, uh, you know, you're all uh, graduated from 12th standard and think about when you are in 6th or 7th or 8th standard and somebody told you that after 5 years you will be going to a university which is located in a place called Sonipat in Jagdishpur village in the rural part of Haryana, would you even believe it? Uh, think about the fact that something like this, all the faculty members were here think about whether you would have thought that a decade ago that you will spend a good part of your future in this Sonipat uh, you know, village. Such has been possible here and so I want you to reflect about those aspects as well as you begin your journey uh, at OP Jindal Global University. So I am personally very excited about it and I look forward to spending more time with you in this school. It's very special for us because we really want to propel the future of uh, humanity studies through the school. We want to be able to uh, do a literary festival uh, with the help of uh, students here and the faculty here. We want to make Sonipat as a hub of uh, uh, literary conversations. Uh, I, I think I will also share with you something quite extraordinary which we didn't know till recently. We prepared a, a coffee table book of the university and uh, uh, another extraordinary historical fact that the, uh, the oldest or the earliest uh, uh, you know, excavations under the Harappan civilization, the Indus Valley civilization, people used to believe it is from what is now in Pakistan. But the most recent excavations have shown that the earliest such excavations happen to be in a place called Rakigiri, which is in Haryana, very close to where we are. And it gets even more interesting. The old Grand Trunk GT Karnal, GT Road, passed through the campus and we have now got to 
have evidence in the form of co-seminars, the road that Shersha should be built, which will connect not just the subcontinent, but be even beyond, passes through our campus. So our argument is we are the center of the global civilization. And this is where it all happens. So you are part of history as well. So try to understand the history in the context of where we are located. I invite you to read the coffee table book, which will give you the context of what has happened here and how you are going to be part of the present and the future. So um, as I conclude, I want to uh, take a moment to express my heartfelt gratitude and sincere appreciation to Professor Dr. Subano Chatterjee, a distinguished professor at the University of Delhi uh, at the Department of English uh, for taking time out of his busy schedule and to come from uh, DU and to be here uh, to deliver the commencement lecture. We look forward to uh, hearing. I intend to stay a bit, but I will quickly slip at some point of time as I need to be in Delhi uh, for a meeting. But I intend to stay as long as I can. So thank you very much. Um, in, in some ways, English uh, serves as a kind of link language or means of uh, apprehending, understanding thoughts and ideas expressed in many languages, including Indian languages. And uh, you'll all get to know um, Dr. Tony Chakrabarti this semester. She's teaching one of your core courses and also an elective. Um, but rather than just emphasize her youth, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm pointing out that uh, the work she herself has done to this point, I think, uh, illustrates um, perfectly the kind of direction English studies has been taking in recent decades. It's really world literature, comparative literature, and many of the um, courses that you'll be taking, even within the program, can be described as um, comparative literature and world literature. So English is the medium, in some ways it's the message, um, and I just thought I would take a moment to introduce uh, the next introducer. So over to you, um, Tony. Professor Chatterjee has given sustained attention to media practice in India. For example, in his book, Tracking the Media, Interpretations of Mass Media Discourses in India and Pakistan. He has co-edited literature anthologies as well as several other works on media. <clears throat> Not least of all, Professor Chatterjee has been preoccupied with the past and future of English studies in India. He is co-author with Suman Gupta, Richard Allen, and Shupriya Choudhury of Reconsidering English Studies in Indian Higher Education. Professor Chatterjee has been a member of the Department of English, University of Delhi, since 2001, and he was previously a lecturer in English at Hindu College and St. Stephen's College. I had the privilege of being his student uh, in the 20th century poetry drama course when I was getting my master's. Uh, in Delhi University. He has held visiting faculty appointments in Brazil, Japan, the UK, and the US. His many professional distinctions include the Kluge Postdoctoral Fellowship of the Library of Congress in Washington, DC, and the Academic Writing Residency at the Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Center in Italy. Professor Chatterjee was a recipient of a Felix Scholarship while at Oxford University and of multiple Fulbright Awards, and he has served on selection and review boards for Felix and Fulbright. The title of his speech today is English Studies in India, Past and Present. Please <coughs> join me in welcoming Professor Chat. Why study the humanities? It's a question that I'm asked even after almost 40 years in the profession. What is the point? I mean, what, what do you do? Uh, people are astonished that uh, people like myself are paid to read and, <laughs> and, and think, which, is, which I don't entirely blame them for. It's, it's a bit like <laughs> the... The, the reaction that your cousins had. Um, so, um, but anyway, I'll, I'll try and take up some of this, these issues, although the larger issue of why it's study the humanities is something that I can perhaps talk about at length later. I want to thank you, Professor Rajkumar, uh, for inviting me, Professor Layton. Uh, welcome to the faculty and especially to the students. You are as your Vice Chancellor pointed out, pioneers. I congratulate you on your admission. And uh, I hope and I am sure that you will have a wonderful uh, four years here. So what I'm going to try and do here, very briefly, because I have a habit of talking uh, forever, is to indicate some debates and contexts regarding English studies in India. Now, there are the histories and the complexities of English literary studies in India have been mapped at least since 
the 1980s. So some of you would be familiar with this, go from Gauri Vishwanathan to Swati Joshi to Rajeshwari Sundarajan and uh, more recently uh, A.K. Mukherjee's The Gift of English and so on and so forth. Now Rajan, for instance, while raising the issues of crisis, there is this whole idea that English studies is always in a state of crisis in India. What are we in India studying uh, English either as a language or as a literature? And referring to the state of crisis, she said there was little because there was there were questions in the 80s that maybe we should abolish the discipline. From time to time, some universities think it's better to get rid of the English department. But she said that it's better not to abolish the discipline because I quote, English literature is theoretically and technically the most developed of the disciplinary literary studies we have in the Indian Academy. And that for better or for worse, it stands in for the humanities by providing the equivalent of a literary education and a liberal education. For many teachers of English, the subject seems to be worth retaining because the values associated with culture as a whole are found in the curriculum at present only in English. At the same time, however, it is precisely this Arnoldian repository of cultural values that Rajan acknowledges to be problematic and expressive of the difficult spaces occupied by English. So English on the one hand, as you know, is a marker of symbolic, social, and cultural capital. On the other hand, of course, it is an alien presence, symbolic of colonized minds. This whole idea that we are still beholden to an alien language. The social and cultural capital of English, as you know again, harks back to the colonial era, but also encompasses the post-colonial in the ways in which English serves as markers of class, education, ability, even merit. India's post-independence elite, as we know, were mostly Anglophilic in taste and orientation. Education at private schools and colleges groomed the elite for entry to the rarefied world of English-speaking power groups. But this again has changed considerably since the 1980s because the non-English speaking elites to spheres of influence, the entry of non-English speaking elites to spheres of influence and power have, has considerably changed the discursive hold that English has had. However, with the global orientation of the Indian economy, English is once again linked with the desirability and necessity of acquiring the language in a globalized world. And it is this necessity, this use value, that seems to explain the persistence of English studies in varied forms. The point that, uh, again, going back to why study uh, English uh, literature and the humanities broadly. Many champions of literary studies in English might be disturbed by the instrumentalization of the discipline and hold on to visions of critical thinking and analytical skills. Now, these debates, of course, are not unique to India. Just to give you an example from the US, there's a, uh, a book by James English who writes, these internal struggles between contemporary and traditional material, between practical and intellectual uses of that material, between refinement of the literary habitus and attainment of basic transportable skills have helped to shape the very, have, sorry, have helped to determine the very shape of our discipline and course of its history. So within contemporary Indian contexts, these debates are heightened by the opening of the economy in 1991 and conflicting relations between English and its others, specifically usefulness, practical skills, Indianness, and traditional values. Now I want to go a little, the, this is the past aspect of the, of the talk as it were. Uh, back into uh, the national education policy of 1986, of course, we've moved on with, uh, as you know, with the national education policy of 2020. Now, Alok Rai, writing in 1991 about the national policy on education of 1986, was uh, very disappointed by what he saw. He said, and I quote, the controlling vision, if it may be dis dignified as such, is that of narrow-minded grad grinds, energetic helots, vainly trying to fit the complexity of human response into simple utilitarian equations. Again, this constant uh, 
contrary, the, 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 the contradiction between thinking and useful and use value, as if the two were somehow separated, which in, in itself is problematic. Now, in searching for the role of the humanities in this policy document, Rai said that he searched in vain for the merest suggestion that the humanities themselves might have a more than merely ornamental or instrumental function, that they might in a country only recently enabled to attend with full seriousness to the task of envisioning its possible future, participate in the process of the definition and crystallization of social goals. Now, Rai argues, as others have before and after, that an education in the humanities is particularly unsuited to factory methods of production. It requires an infinitely patient and sensitive attention to the subtle processes by which the world acquires meaning and resonance. And over the four years, I am sure your, um, your sense of the world, at least I hope, will be enlarged, challenged, and changed. Rai's essay is valuable, not only because he exposes the contradictions in the education policy and its attitudes towards the humanities, but because he raises questions that resonate for English studies today. Again, I'm quoting from Rai. Can English in India shed its colonial legacy of effete aestheticism and develop an identity and range of interest more in keeping with the excitement that the discovery of the ineluctable textualization of reality has generated in literature departments internationally? Even more to the point, can English escape from its fatal complicity with an iniquitous social order? My answer to this, of course, is to both questions is yes. English in India has textualized variated realities, and it does engage with what he calls an iniquitous social order. Because the English syllabus that I studied and some of us studied and what you are going to study is very different. Uh, Tony's PhD is an example of that, and many uh, there, there are others, uh, Kanupriya here. Now, this has happened because, of course, as you know, the Anglo-American great tradition has been opened up. Opened up to writings from the global south, from settler colonies, writings in translation from South Asia and across the world. So, for just to give you an example, from my university, the undergraduate syllabus teaches not only Shakespeare, Milton, and Swift, which I believe are worth reading, but also Kalidas, Premchand, Marquez, and even Ian Fleming. Writings by Dalit writers were, have been introduced across BA, MA, and MPhil programs, allowing for access to ideologies and experiences which were either thought unfit for academic study or are unavailable. As with debates over the canon elsewhere, the ones in India were fiercely contested and revolved around one particular debate I remember is that the Anglo-American texts have intrinsic value, that somehow other texts don't. Now, that, of course, I hope is a debate that is laid to rest. There was also resistance to the introduction of Indian writings in English and in translation. These arose partly out of a concern about the so-called dilution of literary standards, especially since undergraduate courses were perceived as sacred introductions to the field. Now, again, this is a thing of the past. Close reading of texts along the lines of new criticism dominated classroom teaching when I was a student. The gradual incursion of literary theory, critical theory, has upset modes of perception and uh, also pedagogy. Uh, the other aspect, of course, is the change in the composition of the student body itself. Publicly funded and even private universities such as yours are, are admitting students from a very different sociological background. Okay? And this has enabled first generation learners um, to access higher education. And most especially and valuably in English. Because English, the language and its literary productions are maybe caught up in what Alok Rai calls fatal complicity with an iniquitous social order. But as we know, for just to give you an obvious example, many Dalits have embraced English as a language of empowerment and development. So it's not just about uh, an iniquitous social order. 
Right. Uh, very briefly, uh, very quickly, a bit about the, some larger issues and tensions. The field of English studies in India exists within a complex network, as I said, of desire for global standards of excellence, defined sometimes in terms of university rankings and ratings, and but increasingly also in terms of academic excellence. Now, higher education policies and practices are framed within neoliberal and free market ideological domains. For example, just to give you an example from 19 years ago, this is a UGC report in 2003, which said challenges in higher education are no longer nation-centric. They have already attained global dimensions, particularly after trade in services has been brought under the purview of the WTO regime. Now, the dominant response to this perceived global challenge has been a drive towards massification, focusing on numbers rather than on quality. For instance, there is a policy to improve gross enrollment ratio. Now, my problem is not with increasing enrollment, but the ways in which we allow more students to have access to quality higher education, the kind of quality higher education, for instance, that you will get here. Policy pronouncements over the decades have tried to work towards creating and accessing global standards without thinking through the particular aspects and consequences of massification. Because we need, again, just to repeat, I think uh, massification, access to as many people who wish to access higher education with quality accreditation, with uh, quality faculty and thinking through the aims of higher education in a globally enmeshed economy. Um, okay, just a few last comments and then I want to move to the more interesting part, at least for me, uh, which is a responses from students uh, like yourselves, which we did uh, a survey. It's 10 years old, but uh, it still might speak to some of the issues that I've talked about. The impact of globalization in English studies in India, as I said earlier, is seen largely through the prism of language skills, leading to communicative jobs. This is the idea of skilling India that dominates certain landscapes. Within this framework, literary studies is perceived as not useful. It's a soft subject with little impact in the real world. The desired and desirable language skills are imparted by gl global conglomerates such as Pearson and the government-aligned organizations such as the British Council. Both conceptualize English in terms of language skills that can be translated into knowledge economies. This combined with the intermeshing of global networks of capital flow and government policy diminish, I believe, the value of critical thinking skills that literary studies may impart. But they heighten the necessity of English language skills purely for communicative purposes. Now, I do not wish to downplay the value and importance of English language teaching, or indeed linguistics. But what is significant is that within some university systems, language teaching is left largely to non-specialists, so that the specific domains of, say, ELT, English language teaching, or EAP, English for academic purposes, are ignored, leading to a further diminishing of skills that are paradoxically sought to be import, uh, imported to students. What, are, what does literature studies mean in such a scenario? What are its futures? A sense of beleaguered outposts in the midst of a turn to the practical and the impactful is, as I have argued earlier, not new but globalization is particular to the current moment. And I think some of the uh, points that Professor Rajkumar made in his, in his uh, uh, speech are, are interesting here because English studies is important precisely because it enables you to think and it, it allows for critical thinking and analytical skills not in an abstract sense, but in a sense that will get you uh, good jobs. I, I see, um, just to give you a, and then I'll move to a, a non-academic example. From my own cohort, there were 19 of us as undergraduates uh, in English honors in 
a particular college in Delhi University, only three of us remain in academics. Uh, the rest have uh, the range of uh, jobs is from artificial intelligence to banking to finance uh, to uh, media and communications, publishing, uh, and much else. I don't remember the rest. Oh, one of them is a is a um, uh, high level interpreter uh, and translator. She. Um, translates for, uh, interprets for prime ministers and presidents and so on and so forth. So, so that is, that will give you a sense. This is okay, this is ancient history, but these people are still alive and working. Uh, so there is, there are, this is what English honors can, can give you. I now want to move to uh, the survey part of it, and I have a few uh, uh, slides with the quotations. Uh, this is part of uh, the book that was mentioned, uh, uh, Rethinking English Studies in Indian Higher Education. This is a project that uh, I was a part of with the Open University in the UK and uh, JNU and Jamia Millia. And part three of the questionnaire ended with an open question. I think I have the questions on the slide, if I can. If you can, uh. so while it comes on, the questions were, how have your English courses contributed positively or negatively to your development? The next slide, please. Ah, you have a click. See, this is, this is what I like. Yeah. <laughs> these, these are things that make life easier both in, in classrooms and elsewhere. Yeah, okay, can so. You, can you switch off those, uh, switch off those lights uh, on top? Right there, right there. Behind mm -hmm. your seats, yeah. Yeah, good, that's yeah. good. Yeah, thank you. So, you can see the questions. How have your English courses contributed positively or negatively to your development as a person? Yeah, please explain briefly. As anticipated, responses were varied. But there are certain patterns, which uh, a few of which I will share with you, and may help us to configure the value respondents perceived as inherent in their English studies courses, beyond just skills and career prospects. Skills and career prospects are very important. Yeah, there's no way I would minimize that. But the respondents, it's interesting. We surveyed about 600 undergraduate students. So it's a still a small number, but nevertheless, it gives us uh, some uh, clues. Um, the other questions, of course, was uh, what do you think are the key issues that need to be addressed in English studies in India and, in and internationally? And apart from skills and employment prospects, value was perceived as related to rights, identity, and empowerment, and also in terms of morals and ethics. Now, most respondents, both honor students and non honors spoke of value in terms of skills. Characteristic of many responses is the one on the screen. Uh, this is a third year honor student from Jamia Millia Islamia. I have gained confidence in speaking and writing skills in the language. It has improved my reading skills. It made me familiar with other cultures and literatures. Yeah? Um, this is the kind of response that uh, this is the kind of response, of course, that would make uh, any teacher happy. B. Okay. B is a non-honor student from a college in Delhi University, Kamla Nehru College. Um, it has contributed to my development as a person, business English. Yeah. We've kept the original uh, English so that whether they are second year or third year, one of the issues, of course, that as teachers of English, we noticed is maybe they needed to do some uh, uh, writing classes. But anyway, most respondents thought of English studies in terms of empowerment and questions of identity. Here is a, uh, sorry, maybe, yeah. Uh, 
this is again a second year honor student at Jamia Millia broadened my academic horizons but also made me aware of myself helped me articulate things and assert my social identity And this question of identity and empowerment came back in various ways across different institutions. I just want to share with you several from one college. This is Indraprastha College for Women in DU, Delhi University. Most of the responses related to notions of English studies as cultural and social capital. These are all uh, from the honors course. So here is uh, a student who says it encouraged me to stand up for the rights not only my rights the rights of my own sex it's been an empowering tool always wanted to pursue this course i am thankful to god my parents i am very happy yeah wonderful response yeah uh, so uh, again at the end of four years when you hand in your uh, survey forms i hope uh, you will feel the same way um here is another student from the same college personality development and she's honest it was not my first choice but it changed my ideals and notions i am more confident and determined my love for books has only increased okay. amazing responses huh? yeah this this is uh, an and, and then surprising but i but i have some some not so positive ones which i'd like <laughs> to share sure. yeah but these are these these uh, even 10 years later i i am uh, I, I feel happy when I see this. Yes. Then again, from IP College, English uh, has greatly affected my ideological and cultural perspective. Drawn my attention to gender issues. Um, again, IP College uh, is, as you know, a women's college, but that's not the only reason why they are thinking about gender issues. And G, they responded again. One of the best de decisions I have made is joining this English course. It has sharpened my sense of right and wrong. Yeah. it has helped me understand my goal in life better so again this is the point why study the humanities not so critical thinking not as some kind of woolly headed academic stuff but because it has sharpened my sense of right and wrong because we i live in the real world and because therefore i it enables me to think about the world that i live in now it is interesting that respondents from this college generally didn't refer to skills in practical terms but to gendered identity to social and ethical questions now demographically as you know most students at ip college are from middle and upper class its english department is committed to scholarly and pedagogical excellence classes are relatively small like yours allowing for closer interaction between teachers and students now i want to turn to a college i am more familiar with St Stephen's founded by the Cambridge Brotherhood in 1881 it has a similar profile to in the Prest college uh, of course it is co-educational it is more conscious of its elite status in the orbit of higher education however surprisingly at least for people like myself the responses were less enthusiastic here is one the contribution that english has made to my life is largely negative <laughs> it is difficult to re lead a normal life so she but, is but you know but, but it does enable this person to write pretty well yes I mean, think about it yeah talking yeah. about excessively <laughs> questioning norms traditions and values clearly a 12th standard student pursuing Yeah. EBA is not going to write that. It's going to There is an there is an <laughs> absolutely. There's another one uh, which uh, which is on the screen. I'll just put this up which is even again she's not happy but the writing is uh, so something is <laughs> has worked. Funny. Something yes. has happened. Yes sir. Uh, this is the one I was mentioning. It's a wonderful subject. History, politics, sociology. It it broadens one's uh, world view but she says my passion for reading has died down i still love to read but i prefer courses uh, books outside my course eh? i feel not nauseated i need space i don't wish to continue studying english uh, then is you have to figure that out <laughs> yes. what kind of books you're going to give yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this survey was in 2012 so this is 10 years ago yeah but uh, we put this up uh, i mean i i wanted to share this one this is uh, part of the larger uh, 
published work that we have on this because it's it's very interesting that you get really quality education in one of the best undergraduate institutions uh, in uh, in in India perhaps and you come out with this but all is not doom and gloom here is another one opened my mind to a great extent she's and and here she says very clearly that uh, I studied CBSC and English was negligible yeah, it encouraged me to think about issues and then she's offering suggestions yeah? Some areas of literary study are neglected, especially the study of linguistics. The course and, and something that which, which must be said, yeah, because English literary studies, and this I think is a uniquely Indian phenomenon. I have not found this elsewhere. There's a, there's a clear divide between literature and, and language and linguistics, which is, which is quite strange. Then goes on to say, too exam oriented, which completely destroys original thought which I am I'm inclined to agree with. And then the, the next slide, yeah. This I think, again, very useful. It would have been helpful to have a course in academic writing because we are never taught to write. That's something, it's, it's as if you come with a natural uh, God-given ability to write. Some do, uh, a few, minority, yeah, but I, I find writing very difficult. Uh, and it requires practice. So I'm glad somebody in the third year is thinking that I wish we had been taught how to write. Yeah. Okay. So there seems to be an ex expectation that English studies, particularly literature, and all the responses that I've given you, more or less, uh, barring one or two, are from honor students, ought to alleviate burdens rather than lead to too much questioning, and that they should be uh, rooted in the students own context. A fairly standard response is that English studies is not geared towards use value, particularly since thought and analysis are seen to be without such value. But Jay's response is interesting because she's aware of the artificial disjunction, as I said, between literary studies and linguistics and aware that academic writing is a skill that needs to be taught. Now respondents, just a few more and then I will wrap up. Please tell me when my time is up so that I can stop. Yeah. Uh, non honor students expressed anxieties related to skills and their usefulness in real world situations. Time and again they wrote about spoken English and it's a very sensitive point. This is a non honor student case, a non honor student from, uh, uh, from uh, Kamla Nehru College more importance should be given to basic English speakings because I have many friends who jumble up tension, uh, tenses and do not communicate well. Uh, whether it's her friends or whether it's herself, we do not know, but it's this whole idea that English speaking skills are important. Yeah? Another non honor student, that is uh, L, we are not able to speak or talk in English. The reason it is not taken as a language but as a subject and students are forced or laughed by other peer group for wrong grammar. Fine should be imposed not on speaking wrong English for being laughed at. Now that's, I, there's obviously something working there which of course we did not go into, but this whole idea that the social, cultural and social capital of English and the ways in which class variations figure therein. Yeah? Accents for instance, yeah? as markers of I don't know what, uh, markers of excellence, markers of class, which is, which again is a uniquely, I think, Indian issue. When I taught in Japan, I did not come across this at all. Right, there's an, um, okay. There, were, there are many other responses where this sense of distress comes up. Um, and uh, that, language teaching, language skills are very important. Linguistic uh, capability is something uh, very important. Uh, with response to the uh, question of value, what is the value of English studies? The idea of moral value came up in many responses when we asked them about the key, uh, on key issues in English studies in India. Some of them stressed 
on the need to have more Indian authors. This is a non-honor student, P, uh, yeah, that's M, sorry, uh, a non-honor student uh, in Indraprastha University, not Indraprastha College, Indraprastha University in Delhi, uh, who writes, writing standards of Indian authors is good. Text should be given a chance rather than following Western text blindly. Now, of course, I, don't, I didn't uh, check the syllabus in detail, but Indian authors are taught across syllabi. Um, the second uh, to N and O are honors students from Rajdhani College, which is a constituent college of Delhi University. Stu studies should be more moralistic and moral issues and also some of the major issues such as corruption, black money, etc., praising the Indian society. Now, this is, th there, were, there were a few of these, and these are interesting, because the focus here is on moral issues and an unease, I suspect, arising from the interrogation of everyday norms related to gender, class, caste, etc. Yeah, so what makes uh, students at an elite women's college such as IP liberated and feel liberated? Uh, you know, it provides uh, the, what they find liberating, sorry, their counterparts in a less elite institution find threatening and destabilizing. And I think that is quite interesting because we are dealing, as I said earlier, with a uh, very wide range of students. Yeah? And uh, the teaching machine often does not cater to this range. Although in a small cohort like here, for instance, it's much more, it's much easier and it's much more practical to, to do that. Okay, this is the last response that I want to end with because uh, it's much more upbeat. Literature moves me, shakes me, makes me cry, makes me laugh, de-stresses me, gives me goosebumps too. I'm emotionally involved into it, completely enjoying study it, studying it. I do not know where this course would lead me, but I know I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> yeah? It has made me a little more of a feminist, and etc. And I wanted to end with this, uh, at least in terms of the responses, I wanted to end with this because I hope, and this is addressed to uh, all of the, the, the fortunate few who have taken admission to this course, that you too will feel this way as you embark on an exciting on exciting journeys of discovery thought where your uh, where certain ideas that you have may uh, be expanded some may be overthrown you might question your own assumptions and so on and so forth the best things about uh, a, a course in the humanities now if time permits i list yeah Okay, just a few comments because there's, um, there was a professor in Mumbai University, then Bombay University, Yasmin Lukmani, in the Department of English, and she conducted a very small survey in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. This was published in uh, Rajeshwari Sundarajan's book. She had responses from 50 English literature students. We had about, as I said, 600. All the students she surveyed were in the third year of their BA honors program from six colleges within the University of Bombay, falling within Greater Bombay. <coughs> Lukmani's report focused on the integrative instrumental aspects of English literary studies and attempted, as she said, to determine, and I quote, the attitudinal orientation towards studying English. This is the title of her essay. Her Sample, of course, is very small, but I think she offers an interesting set of conclusions which I wanted to share, and I'll just quote this. Lukmani found, I don't think I have this, uh, sorry, this is, uh, no, I'm sorry, I don't have it, but I'll just read it out. Lukmani found that, one, the need for English is so overwhelming that regardless of socioeconomic status, exposure to English in their homes, or the marks they got in their total academic or English performance, they are oriented to study English. That was the first conclusion. Two, the primary di driver for English literary studies was it will improve my competence in the English language. 
and 3 in comparison with her earlier study of Marathi medium school leaving students which she had conducted in 1972, language background is irrelevant in determining students orientation to learn English. And then she has various other comments which I won't go into but I want to quote one last uh, long passage from this essay be partly because I, well, I disagree and I just want, but I want to put it out there. Lukmani observed and I quote, that curriculum developers at Indian universities have continued to treat English literature as component of humanities programs, ideally leading to students' cultural en enrichment, adding to their knowledge of life, and inculcating in them the right values which are its professed functions in the West. But Indian students, Lukmani goes on to write, tend to remain aloof from involvement in the representation of life in English texts. Their interest is in the medium rather than the message, the language rather than the culture, and the benefit they hope to attain is proficiency in English rather than integration into a Western cultural ethos. The last bit I would agree with, but I think possibly this is applicable in the early 1990s when English literature honors syllabi were largely anglophone in folk. Lukmani's observations seem to reiterate a nativist argument and perceive English studies purely in instrumental terms outside the frame of the humanities. Whether the stated or implied aims and ends of such syllabi was integration into a Western cultural ethos is entirely debatable. And in any case, it sets up a false dichotomy between hermetically defined Western and Eastern cultures, Western and Indian cultures. The idea that literary studies is purely a means to language acquisition is purely is also problematic since her questionnaire did not pose questions related to cultural and ideological awareness and personal development and thus did not elicit the kind of feedback that we got in 2012, often revealing a more nuanced relationship between the two. But Lukmani's study with its limitations of sampling and conclusions is nevertheless a valuable signpost from a different locus and time and highlights the necessity of more extensive surveys in English studies across different regions and institutions in India. And perhaps this, after four years, I will come back and survey all of you. <laughs> yeah? Well, uh, that's, that's not a threat. Uh, but with that, I, I will end and thank you very much. I'm genuinely very excited that we're finally starting to work. I had this chat with my colleague here uh, in the morning that I really could not sleep. I was very happy that, okay, it's finally starting. I had some of you, uh, but now I'll read out what I've written, uh, which unfortunately uh, most of the people here have already said, but I'll go ahead with it anyway. So, my dear students, uh, I'm Karampiya Dhinga and you are the first batch of BA Honours English program at the Jindal School in Language Literature. And uh, we have worked for building this program uh, for a year now and it gives me a great, great pleasure to welcome you all here. The last few years have been very difficult and I can only imagine how difficult it would have been for all of you, uh, all of the students who are sitting here with us. The world was going through its worst and you were expected to give your best. And I speak for everyone here that we are tremendously proud of you. You have made it, you are here, you're in a course of your choice, you're in a university that has everything that you need and desire to fulfill your dreams. Learning in general uh, requires the students to show a tremendous amount of faith in their teachers. And in this course, apart from your teachers, the writers, the poets, the playwrights, also want you to really listen to them and pay attention. They want you to, you know, believe in them. So the challenge here, really, is to learn how to challenge, right? Uh, and it's a process, and that's why it's a three to four year degree. Uh, this is why in humanities, you start with a certain faith and not authority. You don't let the text intimidate you, and when you learn to read a text, you also learn how to listen to it so that it will help you interpret it uh, to conceptualize it and then eventually analyze it. Uh, take your first semester course, for example. Uh, you start with building an understanding of what essentially is English literature. Uh, you will learn about the foundations of uh, uh, the 
Western literature, and an important course in writing as well. Uh, you will learn uh, through your electives, you know, depending upon whatever you choose, as to what is popular literature, what is unpopular literature, and why is that. You will have an interesting course in short stories, a course on stories and media and artwork on the uh, partition of India as written by women authors uh, and artists. You have a course in linguistics, you have a course in the Spanosphere, so on and so forth. And um, as diverse as all these courses are, all of these courses are the ones that you will choose later, will help you find your own voice. And while they're doing that, they'll also teach you how to simultaneously listen to the voices that have been so far underrepresented, unrepresented, or marginalized in one way or the other, right? So at the commencement, I want to thank you and your parents as well to have shown immense amount of faith in this faculty, in this uh, school, in this university. And now it's our job to make sure that you learn in intellectually profound, creative, and responsible ways as to how to challenge what you're reading. We are not here to feed you facts. We are here to teach you how to understand things better, and literature is one of the most rewarding ways to be able to do that. Uh, which is why when we keep on saying that this is a pre-professional course which will uh, train you in interdisciplinary ways, uh, how to pursue several professions, this skill of understanding, listening, analyzing, and thinking is what we are here to help you cultivate and develop. Because my lovely students, I really hope you know that um, how powerful, how necessary uh, thinking is to do any job, to follow any passion, to be a responsible citizen of this world, and to be a good human being. I'll end here. Thank you for listening to me, and I hand it over to Neosa. Thank you so much, Kanuri. I was very inspiring. And I think what she said could also be applied to Spanish language, even though Spain in India is not an official language, it's a foreign language. And uh, learning a foreign language is for those who are adventurous enough, that are able or willing to get out of the comfort zone and learn new identities, new worlds, and also getting to know about themselves, as Professor Schubert Tatelio also mentioned before. So as as I said, India, um, Spanish in India is still, of course, it is a foreign language, and it's still very new to, to India, but it's growing a lot. Just as a curiosity, you should know that the Spanish Cultural Center that teaches Spanish here in India, called um, Instituto Cervantes, is the biggest of the world. So the number of students are is, in India is the biggest one. So as you can see, it's really it's booming in India, and um, that's also because not just because of the way that the world is interconnected globally, but also because there are many companies from abroad who are here in India, and uh, many of them are from Spanish-speaking countries. So for such a nascent field this BA has been created to equip students with the foundation so that later they can choose what they want to do in the different uh, career paths. So for this BA, uh, the idea is to teach students with not just the language, but also literature from Spain and Latin America, as well as translation, a bit of history. All of these will not just give them the foundation, but also a B2 level of the language, which is already an advanced level. And uh, that, will, that can be like help with the space abroad that the students can offer, and I really encourage that to, to be done, because the, the career paths of this BA are, is really broad. It can go from education to language, for example, translation, interpreting, but also, as it has been mentioned before, to artificial intelligence, <laughs> business, law, engineering, medicine, and even diplomacy. So as, as the vice chancellor of this university has mentioned, the, it proves how the power of the language. I encourage the students of English to also take some courses in Spanish, whether it's the Spanish language or courses about Spanish literature or culture. 
And uh, I hope, as it has been mentioned before, as another student mentioned before, that you have the time of your life here in this university. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the university. Good afternoon, and uh, good afternoon to Professor Chatterjee. Thank you so much for visiting us and for delivering this commencement lecture. Well, this is Indian history, as the Vice Chancellor rightly remarked. Uh, I have great pleasure in welcoming all the new students to the School of Languages and Literature, the Dean of course and the faculty members we are meeting for the first time, but I'm sure that we will have many more uh, opportunities to meet and engage with and to interact. And congratulations to each one of you for having set this up, the first batch of uh, the B Honors uh, English and uh, the B Honors uh, Spanish program. Uh, this is the 11th school of the university that we had set up at the height of the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic period itself, we established uh, four schools, uh, starting off with the General School of uh, Environment and Sustainability, followed by the General School of Psychology and Counseling, uh, the School of Languages and Literature, and Public Health and Human Development. And when I say this, uh, there is a particular message uh, in this uh, uh, statement of mine. Uh, and that message is that uh, all the students belonging to this school, uh, you have uh, an opportunity to build on uh, the foundations created by other schools and even the courses and the programs uh, started by other schools. Uh, because uh, just to refer to what even the Vice Chancellor had mentioned, the bedrock of this university and the philosophy of this university is interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity. And you are rightly placed, uh, taking cue from Professor Chatterjee, that you are not only going to learn the language per se, but everything in addition to that, and even the context uh, to the uh, language, and even the good work that's been uh, uh, sort of uh, carried out for years by our dear friend Professor uh, Jagdish Patra and uh, there are going to be so many other opportunities so that uh, you want to develop certain attributes in terms of uh, either you know having a deep knowledge of the subject and uh, having uh, the approach or the attitude uh, to develop uh, an appetite for lifelong, le lifelong learning of the subject and even to reflect on the subject that you are learning and even to acquire the much needed uh, transferable skills in terms of being in a position to respect diversity, respect plurality, work in groups, develop leadership attributes and these are all very important once you graduate and go on to pursue whatever uh, choice pursuits uh, that you intend to choose from and uh, we also want you to spend uh, the next three years, if in case you are part of the three years program and even if, intend, if you intend to choose uh, pursuing a master's program here, either offered by the JSLL uh, prospectively or other schools, we want you to enjoy. Enjoy in a very responsible manner. Enjoy the learnings and the opportunities that are provided to you, uh, both within the school and outside the school, and assume a sense of uh, responsible university citizenry uh, in terms of uh, becoming more responsible because being a student of a university is indeed a privilege. So we appeal to you that you use this privilege uh, with discretion and uh, become more responsible towards your own learnings and, then, and even towards the diversity and even the other peers and the friends uh, that you are going to have uh, within the program, within the school, and within the university, and then make your movement and make your times here more joyous, and that's very important. And please be assured of the support from the university-wide offices, whether it is the Office of Career Services, the Office of International Affairs and Global Initiatives. There's never going to be a dull moment here, both in terms of the uh, curricular activities and even the co-curricular and the extracurricular activities that you're going to have and your school is going to tell you more about that in days to come. I'm not going to give you all that information here and bore you but make the most out of it and have an enriching time and an engaging time ahead 
And uh, before I end, I congratulate each one of you and I wish you the very best uh, for your semester work. Thank you so much and thank you, Professor Chatterjee, once again for taking more time to be with us. Just two things I want to say and I would, I would end. Um, one is that uh, uh, Professor Raj, at the very beginning, um, spoke about being out of your comfort zone. And the being out of the comfort zone does not happen only in the context of the course that you're studying or the you know classes that you're doing. It's also staying in the hostel for the first time. It's also interacting with peers who may be very different than yours for the first time. And I just want you to know that there is an entire support system that is there for you available um, to help you navigate through that process. Of course, uh, you know, your faculty is there, they, they mentor you through this process, but the entire administrative machinery is also there to help you navigate. As we speak, I know that two of your friends have fallen sick and they're in the hostel, but I want you to know that our, our people are standing with them, taking them to the health center, talking to the parents. So don't feel alone, don't feel lost, uh, don't feel that you know, you're, you're required to grow up overnight. You don't. You can take your time and you can reach out to us for any help. Don't feel isolated. It can get a bit overwhelming. I remember when I came to study in Delhi University and, and uh, a few decades back, uh, you know, the first day, it was so overwhelming um, to just suddenly walk in and I'm from Assam and, you know, drive from uh, Assam to, to land and a lot of you, what you said actually resonated with me, the idea of, if people didn't, I mean, I thought I spoke very good Hindi and I came here and they're like, what is that accent? You don't understand it. So it took time and I can, I can understand what an overwhelming process it can be. But I want you to know that you're not alone um, in this journey. You have your peers, you have your faculty, and you have all of us. So my role as the Dean of Admissions and Outreach honestly doesn't end just because you are in here. Please feel free to approach any time. I live on campus, my office is on campus. So at any time, if you feel the need to come and converse, please feel free to do that. Um, the, the second thing that I want to say, I believe it is uh, psychologist Robert Holden uh, who said, beware of destination complex. Uh, we are always so focused on reaching a destination, acquiring a skill, um, getting the job, what will this course do to me, that we forget to enjoy the journey and forget to enjoy the moment, forget to enjoy the everyday that happens in the context of the classroom. You have such tremendous, look at your faculty is not so, so excited and I think that that is, um, you know, what's something that you need to constantly be getting motivation from and enjoy that moment. I, I wish I had faculty who felt the same. I, I wish, you know, I, my faculty felt as excited about the course that I did when I walked in. Um, so these are the moments that, that you must enjoy, understand, appreciate. And the rest will happen. The magic will happen when you're not looking. Um, so the rest will happen. Again, congratulations. And because it is the vote of thanks, um, let me take a moment. Um, to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, our Vice Chancellor, um, whose vision and leadership has actually made um, the setting up of the school and and the vision for the program possible. Um, Dean Dennis, um, the faculty, Professor Batra, uh, who have been working tirelessly to make the course possible, and and of course the journey now begins. Um, I really, really, uh, Professor Jackie, enjoyed your talk. And as Dean Dennis said, uh, we have been attending a lot of commencement lectures and it can, um, as he said, become a task. Um, but it was so fascinating listening to you and it resonated so much uh, with many of the thoughts that I've had or many of us have spoken about that it really did not feel like a task. We were completely immersed in what you were seeing and how we can take it forward. So thank you so much um, for that. And uh, thank you to our dear registrar, Professor Patnaik, who is always there to, to support us and uh, who has uh, stood by rock solid uh, for all the work that we have done as part of the Office of Admissions and Outreach. And this will not be complete if I don't thank Shalini, I know Arpit is not here, um, Ishan and all the people at the admissions team um, who have been working tirelessly to make this day happen. So thank you once again. Welcome to JGU and I, I can't wait to um, be part of this journey with you. Thank you very much.